return with me to the idea we covered last lesson. I did warn you. <laughs> we looked at these. Do you remember these guys, right? Um, I gave you an example Z1, and then I said, well, if you successively multiply through by, what do we multiply by in this case? It was i, wasn't it, right? Every time you multiply by i, you get this new complex number, and I ask you to consider with me what the real and imaginary components were. And then we notice this unusual pattern, that at least for these numbers, the first, second, third, fourth number, we're in the first, second, third, fourth quadrant. It's almost like it was planned to do that, right? So we introduce this idea that we can um, take these ordered pairs, place them onto a Cartesian plane like this, right? And say, oh, there's rotation going on. These complex numbers actually are best easily understood in two dimensions. That's what we suggested, right? Now, what you've got here, and if you want to go back to where you uh, did this you know, last lesson, what you've got here is what we call a Cartesian plane. It's just got Cartesian coordinates on it. The x's and the y's are both real numbers, but then we extended it, even though the diagram looks materially the same, we extended to say, we can represent complex numbers, not talking about a real x and a real y, but talking on the complex plane about these being, well, just have a look at the coordinates, right? Um, they're not really coordinates at all. See this guy here, right? 2 minus 5i, that's not this part and this part. That's a whole, whole's not the right word. That's a unified number. 2 minus 5i is one thing that I'm considering together, and it represents a point on the plane. Now, some of you may have heard this, uh, this language used before, but um, Cartesian plane, right? Uh, it's named after a French mathematician. Does anyone know his name? René Descartes. René Descartes, right? So Cartesian plane. We name the complex plane, or particularly a complex plane when you put complex numbers on it, we name it after another French mathematician. His name was Jean-Robert Argand. A-R-G-A. N D. So we call this, and you'll hear us say this, and we might ask you in an assessment, right, to plot on an Argand diagram these complex numbers or do these, uh, you know, geometric operations. It's more or less synonymous with the complex plane. Okay, so if you hear either of those phrases, they essentially mean the same thing. So now let's start to explore what, what does this geometric idea unlock for us? What sort of, this is a key, what doors does it open? Okay, um, if you have a look at those complex numbers that I gave you at the start and um, the operations I asked you to do about this, right? Arithmetically, we know what addition and subtraction do to complex numbers. But now we can think about what does it mean geometrically? Like when you do Z1 plus Z2, what does that look like? Z1 minus Z2, and so on, right? So onto your complex plane, I asked you to do this basically, though I did add on something which um, is implied, which is a line from the origin up to our complex numbers, Z1 and Z2. Some of you did that instinctively. If you haven't already, that's fine. Go ahead and add them on now. And as I said before, and I'll say again, if you have more than one color on your um, desk at the moment, this is gonna be really helpful. You'll see why very shortly, okay? So here are my Z1 and my Z2. Now, on this scheme, where is Z1 plus Z2? You evaluate it, what, what is it actually equal to? 4 plus 3i. So you can see where this should be. On your complex plane, on your Argan diagram, could you go ahead and put that on for me? There's 4 plus 3i. And I'm, I'm calling it Z3 just so I don't have to keep on, you know, giving it the actual numbers. So I'm just going to describe that as Z3. Um, and there, of course, is our coordinate, 4 plus 3i. Now, I want you to look at the geometry of what's going on. What is the visual relationship between this new point up here, Z3, and the numbers that sort of went into it, the numbers that contributed to make it, right? Now maybe if you squint really hard, you might notice there's kind of an implied shape underneath the origin over there at the intersection between the real and imaginary axis, the origin between our two points, Z1 and Z2 that we started with, and Z3 up in the corner. If we were to join them in a polygon, what shape would that give us? That would give us a parallelogram. Can you visualize it? And there's a reason for this, right? When you think about what it means to add Z1 to Z2, what we're really doing is we're kind of, the fancy word is concatenating. We're putting together these two operations, as it were. 
Z1, 3 plus i, takes you to this place on the complex plane. You can think of it like a, a, a set of instructions. Go here, right, on a GPS. And then Z2 tells you to do something else. Go one to the right, that's what the real part means, and then two units upwards, that's what the imaginary part means. And so you can see there's this, well it's literally parallel to where Z2 was over there. So if you enact Z1 as a movement, as a translation, and then if you enact Z2, you end up with Z1 plus Z2. And of course, um, addition, by the way, it's an operation that we can change its order. Right? Does anyone remember a long fancy word we learned in year seven that means you can change the order of operation, you get the same answer? Does anyone remember? Commutativity, when you say two things are commutative, you can switch their order. So Z1 plus Z2, presumably, is the same as Z2 plus Z1. Now visually, that means something again, right? Doing Z1 and then Z2 takes you to the same destination as if you had done Z2 first and then Z1. And that's why you get a parallelogram, right? We're preserving the fact that these are parallel and they're also the same length, right? Because we get them from Z1 and Z2. Does this make sense? Okay, so that was the first question I asked you to do. Then I asked you to do a subtraction. Z1 minus Z2, where, where is that? What are the, what's the actual complex number? Two, two yeah? Two minus, two minus i, which uh, if I did it right, it's down here. Uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and plot that onto your complex plane on your argan diagram. If you did everything up in the first quadrant, because Z1 and Z2 were in the first quadrant, apologies for that. Extend down your imaginary axis so you can reach down to there, okay? Now this one takes a little more thought to sort of wrap your head around. But hopefully, given the introduction I just gave you with this, you'll be able to make sense of what's happening here. Subtraction is just a special version of addition. Let me say that again. Subtraction is just a special version of addition. If I said to you, eight take away three, that'd be the same as eight plus, plus what? It's, it's say it again, negative three, right? Eight plus negative three and eight take away three, same deal. Now that means that everything, all the geometric intuition we developed up with addition, we can use it for subtraction. Z1, I'm going to have to write this over here, I think I'll have space. Z1 minus Z2, I can write as Z1 plus the negative of Z2. Now geometrically, what, what does that even mean, the, the negative of Z2? Well, we already know this from the real number line, right? If 5's over here, negative 5's just in the opposite direction, right versus left. On the complex plane, we're a little more uh, nuanced than just left and right. We've got up and down, we've got two dimensions, right? So if Z2 is that red line over there, what's minus Z2? Instead of going to the right and up, it's going to be going to the left and down. So if you were to take that left downward complex number and then add it to Z1, well, no surprises that you end up down there. Do you see what's going on here? Right? If I were to just put a, um, I, didn't, I didn't think of this beforehand, so now I'm just going to put it on there. This is minus Z2. That, that's what this thing is here, right? So you do Z1 first, which is the blue line, takes you there, and then you do minus Z2, and that takes you down to the fourth quadrant, right? By the way, you know how you identified this parallelogram that was on there before? There's a parallelogram here too, it's just a little more hidden. Where is it? Can anyone see it? Where did you say minus Z2 went again? What direction did it go in? To the left and then down. So, so it's over here. Do you agree? There's minus Z2 on the left hand side. So that's why here, if I complete, sorry, it's very messy, but you get the idea, right? There's the parallelogram, another one, right? Except it's, it's down beneath because we had this subtraction business. Make sense? Okay, let's put that guy away. Now, the next thing I asked you to do was some multiplication. Right? Again, I'm pressing you to think about not just what the numbers tell you. What are the numbers, by the way? Um, go ahead and tell me what 3z1 is. It's uh, 9 plus 3i. And then 3 plus 6i, right? Okay. You're probably seeing where I'm going here and you're like, oh no, my complex plane is too small. Go ahead and put these guys on as well, okay? if you can fit them. If you can fit them. <laughs> Try your best. Maybe you're going like, to go off the page or something like that. That's okay, go as far as you can. If we were to put these guys on as well, we said 
that adding or subtracting complex numbers is like doing one complex number after another, putting the steps together. That's addition subtraction. Visually, what is multiplication? Now I'm going to have to go over to a different graph. Here's one I prepared earlier. So there is, I um, can't even remember, is that Z1 or is that Z2? That's Z1, right? I got it right. Okay, good. So when we go ahead and plot uh, three times that, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not just sort of randomly placed. You can see what I've done is, and again, so I'm just going to do a screenshot here. What's happening is you do Z1, but then multiplication by three means you do it again, and then you do it one more time. Multiplication is just repeated addition, right? But a more generalized way of thinking about it, because you don't always get like nice integer numbers, right? What if I had, for instance, and I'm going to ask you to put your pens down for a second, just watch this so you can see what's going to happen. What if I asked you to multiply by not three, but say two and a half? What would you predict would be the result? Let's go ahead and change it and see what happens. Did you see it? That's why I asked you to put your pens down. Um, here's multiplication by three. Here's multiplication by two and a half. Or multiplication by one and a half. We need better language than just describing, oh, it's that number of chunks, because when you have non-integer amounts, What's going on here? What word would you use to describe the relationship between the purple complex number and the orange one? Yeah, go ahead. Enlargement with a factor of three. Enlargement is a really good way to go about it. Scale, maybe? All of these are very, I'm happy to use all of these you know, languages right here. Um, by the way, though, uh, did you say enlargement? I said scale, right? Probably the tricky thing with enlargement is it assumes you're getting bigger. What could I do to make my thing smaller? What do I multiply by? So, yeah, let's just change that factor, right? So that's why I think scale might be maybe, a, it's, it's a more broader word that you can use, okay? Um, by the way, we already explored it, but you can see what happens if I go negative. My graph, unfortunately, I couldn't program it to do what I wanted, but you can see where it's going, right? It's going in the opposite direction now because I've got a negative included in my scale. Does this make sense? So it changes the direction. Okay, 